Hi, welcome back to the official podcast of the WCD. It's a World Congress of Dermatology which will be held next in Singapore in 2023. I am Dr. Etienne Wang from the National Skin Centre of Singapore and I will be your host for this podcast. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts and wherever else you get your podcasts. In this podcast, I speak with dermatologists and skin researchers from all over the world to talk about all things dermatology. And today, my resident co-host Shashin is back with a derm topic for discussion. Welcome back, Shashin. Hi, Dr. Etienne, and thanks for having me back. And what do you have to discuss with us today? Right, so for today's uh, discussion, I thought we'd talk about topical steroid phobia or the irrational fear of using topical steroids, which often results in undertreatment of skin conditions. Yes, it's quite prevalent in Singapore. What what have you found about this? Right, so what actually got me thinking about the topic was that sometimes we do get patients in our clinic who say that they applied the cream, but nothing really worked. And when you ask them how much they applied or how often they applied it, they said that they just applied it for a day or two because the label said topical steroids or steroids, and they didn't want any side effects from that. So it got me thinking, A, how prevalent is this in dermatological patients in general? And how can we change this to, you know, improve patients' adherence to treatment? Now, there were some studies that have been done out there as well. And interestingly, the prevalence of topical steroid phobia has ranged from about 21% to 83.7% in some populations. And I thought that was extremely high. Yes, and I think it's, uh, it's very culturally specific as well. And also, you know, there's so many things that go into a patient's perception of topical steroids, everything from the media to the patient sitting next to them in the waiting room to a lot of different things. So it's very hard to pinpoint. What do you think is the actual cause of this? I think for one, it's um, the lack of patient education. Patients hear the word steroid used in many contexts, all the way from um, anabolic steroids to steroids like prednisolone that are taken by tablet. And the moment they find that word and an ointment or a tube of cream, they do think it's the same strength or has the same potency as a systemic steroid. And I think a large part of it is equating the steroids that patients hear about and those side effects with um, what the patient encounters in the dermatology clinic. Hmm. There's also the complete opposite patient who comes in with very potent topical steroids that they've obtained from either a general practitioner or overseas in some pharmacy, and they refuse to stop using it. I think it's, it's pretty much the flip side of the same coin. Yes, two ends of the spectrum. Um, I mean, I remember a story about a patient who had been using using um, clobetasol, a potent topical steroid, almost like a moisturizer daily, and only came to see the doctor once they had developed striae, for example. So it is two extremes of this uh, spectrum. Hmm. And what do you think is a solution to this problem? I think the physician, either the dermatologist or the general practitioner, who first sees the patient has a lot of power in educating the patient. I know some clinics at SGH, for example, we try to give uh, give the patient a leaflet to counsel them about topical steroids because it's at that first visit that the patient usually forms a very strong, sometimes even unshakable idea about the medication that they're about to apply. And often when patients come to us, say the second visit or the third visit, they often say, I wish the previous doctors had told me that this is how I should apply the topical steroids or this is what steroids can do to my skin. If I knew that, I would have used it correctly. So I think educating them early on before they come up with their own ideas or get misconceptions is very important. Well, coincidentally, our co-host Ellie has a study that's almost exactly what we're talking about. Can you tell us a bit more about this study? Yes. So this was a study. It was a double-blinded randomized control trial. Uh, It had about 275 patients, and the patients in the intervention arm were given an educational video and a patient information leaflet, which targeted some common misconceptions on uh, topical corticosteroids. Thereafter, they assessed these patients' steroid phobia using a scale. It was called the topical corticosteroid phobia scale. And interestingly, the mean score in the intervention arm decreased at one month and three months, respectively. And now this reduction was mainly in the knowledge domain. Patients do have certain fears and behaviors. But what this study did show was that even a targeted education given at a single time point improved the score in the knowledge domain. And I think that's a great starting point. Yeah, I think a patient video or even a very well-produced public education video is very useful in this situation. I was actually going, went on YouTube earlier to see whether I could find any videos educating about topical steroids and you know there are almost none none of the skincare influencers are actually talking about it I think it would make a great topic for a video absolutely 
And I find that, I mean, especially in today's uh, climate, a video is uh, more accessible and more interesting to watch than, for example, um, a leaflet, so much far-reaching media. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that very thought-provoking topic, uh, Shashin. I'm sure everyone in at listening will have some sort of experience with this conundrum. I hope it's helpful. Thank okay, you very thank much. Okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. And now I'd like to invite Professor Jerry Shapiro to the podcast. He is a professor at the Ronald Perelman Department of Dermatology at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And previously, he was at Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute. And he was a president of the WCD in Vancouver in 2015. Welcome, Jerry, to the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Jerry, you are a worldwide expert on hair loss. Uh, can you just tell us what excites you about hair loss these days? Oh, there are a lot of things that excite me. The newer treatments that are being developed for, uh, for instance, alopecia areata, um, as well as uh, newer things for androgenetic alopecia. When I started 30 years ago, there was very little to offer patients who came into our office. Now, three decades later, we have a palette of options to offer our patients. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, these days, a, a consultation for androgenic alopecia takes quite a long time going through all the options that are out there. What do you think is the most promising thing on the horizon for androgenic alopecia? Well, in terms of what we can use now, uh, uh, that is new, a little bit newer than most, is the use of low-dose oral minoxidil. I think that uh, that has been shown to be quite useful for both men and women. A low-dose oral minoxidil, meaning uh, minoxidil at a dose of 5 milligrams or less. Mm -hmm. And we, we determine the milligram dosage based on the weight of the individual and all this. So I think that's something v that's kind of newish. There are all sorts of new discoveries that are being worked on, but they're not available yet. Okay, uh, there are all sorts of things that I think we will have maybe 5, 10, or 15 years from now. They're actively being worked on by many labs throughout the world. But right now, you know, we, we, all, you know, we have uh, the oral minoxidil. We also have platelet-rich plasma. Mm, yes. which do, is you, do you do that uh, very often? Yes, it is something that we've published on as well in the American Academy of Dermatology, the journal. And it does have a place. It's not something that works in everybody, but it works in some. And it is a good adjuvant therapy to, for so many people. So I think that's another good option. How it works, we don't really know. We think it has growth factors, you know, epidermal growth factor, VEGF, var various uh, factors that may promote hair growth. For androgenetic alopecia, those are kind of the newer things. When it comes to surgery, you know, there's the robot, there are all sorts of new pieces of equipment that, will, uh, that, that have come out. But the most important thing is follicular unit extractions, taking just a few hairs at a time, like two or three hairs or follicular units, taking each unit and transplanting it rather than taking large strips. Jerry, I, I don't know whether you remember, but I think I've told you this, that you were quite an inspiration for me to doing hair. And actually, the reason why I went into hair research was to get closer to getting a fellowship with you. Do you still do a lot of hair transplantation nowadays? No, uh, n not at NYU. We did do transplantations at the University of British Columbia. But when I moved to NYU, I decided to strictly do medical hair restoration. And a lot of the other lectures that have left a very lasting impression on me, including things like scarring alopecia. What are the new things in scarring alopecia these days? Um, in terms of the treatments, there are new things, but we need more work to study them. For instance, the whole idea of mast cells in lichen planus pilaris, which was found by the, uh, Angela Cristiano lab, may have some importance in terms of treating patients with antihistamines. But we need more studies to help prove that it really, may, it really makes a difference. But I think her discovery of that, you know, adds another tool that we might be able to use. Also, the use of JAK inhibitors in yes. scarring alopecia may be of benefit, both topical or oral, in certain individuals who have lichen plano pilaris. So th there, there are various immunomodulators, uh, newer ones that can be used 
in scarring hair loss. Of course, I mentioned earlier that you were the president of the WCD in Vancouver in 2015. Do you have any advice about running the WCD for next year? Well, I think that the main thing is to get the word out. Uh, we went everywhere. As president, I went to several uh, meetings, uh, definitely the AD, uh, the Latin American meetings, the European meetings, the Asian meetings. We went to all the meetings to help promote. We had booths in every meeting. It, the most important thing is to promote it. Now, because of COVID, you didn't really have the opportunity yeah, it, uh, to do thing. all those things. And it's, it's, it was a problem. I think it's a problem. For us, we, were, we had carte blanche in, in terms of time to go to uh, these places and promote the meeting. And that's how people knew about us. And um, always at talks, present a slide that promotes the meeting and make sure that people know about it and what fabulous things your city or your country can do to make it very interesting. And Singapore is such an interesting place, one of the most interesting in the world. And to highlight the beauty and all the activities, the restaurants, everything that is just so wonderful about Singapore. Hmm, wow, thank you. Yes, Jerry, you were a visiting professor for, my, for a hospital a few years ago. Do you remember? That's when I first met you. Yes, yes. And you approached me for a fellowship even at that point. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As in, I wanted you, but I, I somehow it didn't work out. Uh, but I, I, I definitely was there. Uh, but I've been there many times. One of my former fellows, Eileen Tan, is there. Mm. I visited her as well. So uh, it's a wonderful place. I've been to Singapore quite a few times and I love it. And uh, what's your favorite memory of Singapore? Well, my favorite memory was going to, I think it's called MBS, is mm -hmm. Marina the Bay Marina Sands. Marina Bay Sands, a casino. Yes. Uh, well, the casino, The there was a pool on the top, the restaurant. <laughs> I remember that was what that was a highlight, to, just to go see that building. Also, to go into that Louis Vuitton island, okay, was absolutely interesting because I'd not seen such a, a big store for Louis Vuitton, in, you know, with an island just created for it. <laughs> and now it's got one next to it for an Apple store. Oh, does it? Okay, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, you've got everything there. Yes, so people should be very excited to come to the WCD next year. Yes, oh, they should. There's so much to do. It's not only clean, but it's 100% safe. Yes. Okay, I, you know, everyone feels safe in that city. Women have no problem, you know, they feel safe wherever they go. I think it's just a, a great city in terms of cleanliness, beauty, and safety. Okay, well, thank you. That is a great advertisement for the WCD. And I'd like to thank you again for coming on this podcast, Jerry, and also for being an inspiration and a mentor to me as well. My pleasure. Hope to collaborate very soon. Yes, thank you, Jerry. Okay. Okay. You're Bye. welcome. Bye. <laughs> That's great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. And that was the official podcast of the WCD. Don't forget to follow us on all our socials on Facebook, Instagram at WCD2023 Singapore, and check out our WCD website, WCD2023Singapore.org for more updates and content on the WCD. And until next time, stay safe and use sunblock.